And what I'm going to do tonight is not so much talk about what you're going to see in the film, but what happened that you're not going to see in the film. A lot of people don't realize it, but the IMAX film you're going to see was filmed by a 100-person film crew. 23,000 pounds of equipment was shipped over to Africa. In reality, the expedition occurred with just two people and two IMAX cameras over 114 days and 3,500 miles. So there's going to be a little bit of disconnect, but I hope I know you'll enjoy the film. But I'm, like I said, I'm going to show you some slides now. What um, usually after the show we we, we do a question and answer uh, thing. If you have a question while I'm talking tonight, and if it's a quick question, raise your hand and just blurt it out. All right? Because a lot of times, if you have questions, that helps me remember what happened during the expedition. And trust me, after six months on the river, I'll remember what happened for a while. So let me start off by saying, the title of the film is The Mystery of the Nile. The actual expedition was called the Nile First Descent Expedition. It was the first full descent of the Nile, the Blue Nile and Nile River, starting at 10,000 feet in the mountains of Ethiopia and ending at the Mediterranean 114 days, 3,500 miles later. Amazingly enough, there had been 20 to 30 deaths of people trying to do the expedition, including one of my partners. Uh, friends died on the river. Um, but we were the first expedition to do the entire thing. During that expedition, we never left the river. What we put on the river with in the mountains of Ethiopia, we took off the river in Egypt. We had no support. One film drop in the city of Khartoum was all we had during the expedition. So when, we, when you see this film, you have to realize there was no support crew. When we were on the expedition, there was nobody waiting for us, no one giving us supplies, no one doing anything for us. If we got lost or hurt, no one would even have known about it. So I think that's important for you to remember when you watch it. Now, which one of these do I To the right. Oh, that was the wrong right. No, that's the wrong right, too. <laughs> oh, there we go. All right, I got it now. Keep the dongle pointed. Um, so this is, by the way, the biggest rapid on Blue Nile. <laughs> it is 153 foot tall. Tissisot Falls. Who here knows that the Blue Nile has a 153 foot tall waterfall on it? Now you do. It's the second largest waterfall in Africa. And to say it's spectacular is an understatement. This right here, okay, I got to figure out how this thing works too. That right there is a 16 foot raft. When we said we ran every inch of the Nile, we mean we ran every inch of the Nile. When we came to things like this, we would take the boats, we'd tie a rope on it, and we would drop the boat off the side of the of rapids. And then we would repel after the boat. So we stayed on the river the entire time from when we put on the river to when we took off the river. This, that was in Ethiopia. This is a picture of Sudan now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you real quickly through the Nile. Sudan, unlike Ethiopia, is a big, wide open desert country. The Nile is just magnificent. It's full of granite outcrop. It's, we're, we're in the Nubian Shield here. You can see it's a big, wide river. These are all sand dunes in the background. We traveled almost 70 days in Sudan, and this is all we saw almost every single day were sand dunes, rocks, and villages, palm trees. It was just magnificent. This is Egypt. You all know the secret there. This is where we ended. So what we did is we started in Ethiopia with the white, white water and the waterfalls. We went through the Sudan, and then we went to Egypt. Now what happened was the film crew originally called me, McGill Graffiti Films, out of, out of uh, California, and they asked me, the Luna Beast, they asked me if I wanted to do a river trip and guide a river trip down the Nile. Well, I'd been boating a long time, and what they did is they wanted to make up a river trip. They didn't really want to do the river. They said they wanted me to lead a trip, make it up, do some make, make believe shots, go there, film a little bit in Egypt, film a little bit in Sudan, film a little bit in Ethiopia, put the film together and call it a movie. And I said I wouldn't do it for two reasons. One is I didn't believe in it. So number two is I wanted to do the first ascent of the Nile. I know the white, the Blue Nile had never been run, ever. My partner's friend had, had died on the Blue Nile trying to do the first ascent. So I talked McGillivray Freeman Films, you know, the Everest, they made the Everest film and everything, into giving us enough cash 
and doing the movie, an actual expedition. And I guarantee them, if they would sponsor us and fund our expedition down the Nile, that the footage we brought back and the stories we brought back would be a hundred times better than anything they could ever have imagined to make up. And it was true. After we did our expedition and we came back with footage, they jumped the script, they jumped all the original stuff they had, and they used most of our footage making the movie. Because that's how impressed they were. There we go. So real quickly, I added all these maps because I know geologists like maps. <laughs> so, uh, and the reason being is I just want to show you guys where we're at. So basically, we started at, uh, we started at 10,000 feet. The, this map's not even correct. We actually started down here at 10,000, 9,900 feet in the Ethiopian Highlands of Mount Gish. We floated to Lake Tana. We walked and we kayaked Lake Tana. We took our boats. We did the Ethiopia section of the Nile right here, which is four to five hundred of the biggest rapids I've ever run. We went over to Sudan. We, we, we went into Sudan. We joined the White Nile in Khartoum. We went through the Great S Bend of the Nile, the Nubian Shields here, all the way down to Lake Nasser. We boated a lot across Lake Nasser at Aswan, and we went all the way out to Alexandria, 3,500 miles. What's the connection between the Blue Nile and the White Nile? Uh, good question. The connection between the Blue Nile and the White Nile. The Blue Nile starts up, in, up above in the springs of Gishabai, above Lake Tana. It flows for 3,500 miles. The White Nile starts down in Burundi right here and goes 4,300 miles, so it's technically a longer river. But 70% of the water of the Nile comes from the Blue Nile, not the White Nile. So just like in the United States, the Mississippi, people don't realize the Mississippi is not the Mississippi, it's the Missouri River. The Missouri River is far, far, far longer than the Mississippi River, but it only supplies a part of the flow of the river. The Mississippi provides most of the flow, therefore they say the Mississippi is the main drainage. This is the opposite. Everybody likes to say this is the longest river. Technically it's longer, but 70% of the water comes right down this river right here. So again, we started up in the highlands, we went through the bottom part of the Nile, we went through, there were several small uh, silted up dams, Khartoum, 6th, 5th, 4th, 3rd, all the cataracts down through Sudan, and then into Egypt. A close up, because I'm going to take you through this real quickly, we started here at Mount Gish, the springs of Gishabai, and we went ahead and took our equipment there, and then we went ahead and went down, walked, walked, kayaked down to Lake Tana. We went through Lake Tana to Bahadar, and then we rafted this section of the Ethiopia Blue Nile. The Northern Gorge, the Grand Canyon, the Black Gorge, and the Western Gorges. All in all, about four to 500 major rapids. It was really fun being able to name that many rapids. And then we went out, we hit Bamaza, we got arrested. We went through <laughs> Rosero's Dam, we almost got arrested. And we went out to Khartoum, and that's, that's the, that was the trip. Okay, brief story. So we had a movie to make. Remember, I was hired to make a movie, not run a river at first. I actually talked to these guys in Running River. Now, who here saw the Everest IMAX Everest film? Remember John Krakauer and all the Everest people and all that stuff? These are the same exact cameras that were taken to the top of Mount Everest. The same cameras that went to the top of the Mount Everest, we put on a raft and we took down the entire length of the Nile. And were they heavy? 100 pound cameras with tripods. What happened was, to be able to make a film properly, they weren't sure if we were going to get enough footage on the film on the river. So what they did is they sent a 100 person film crew, 23,000 pounds of equipment, was brought over in November, late November 2003, and for 30 days in Ethiopia and Egypt, we went ahead and had a full film crew and we shot a lot of the scenes you're going to see tonight. It was all shot on IMAX film, 15 Perf 90, which is a big major film. At the end of that, at the end of that, that period of time, um, what happens, we filmed in Egypt, or Ethiopia. We bypassed the Sudan because the Sudan was undergoing a civil war at the time. There were American sanctions against the time. No one would insure our equipment, and we were not allowed in the country. Therefore, we overflew Sudan, we went to Egypt, and we filmed in Egypt. So all the footage that you see that was filmed by the original film crew was only Ethiopia and Egypt. And here's the same thing at Abu Simbel. So what happened was, 
they, we, uh, we've forgotten Sudan. And I'll show you why we forgot the Sudan during the thing. So he does look. But you got to push this thing. Let me cut some back I see if you can put the dongle closer. Yes. <laughs> Matt, can you hear us up there? Can you make the clicker? I got it. I got it. Okay. Uh, helicopter shots. Um, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the shots you're going to see are actually helicopter shots. And this is a helicopter. We actually took what's called the space scan from Hollywood, which is a major. IMAX camera mounted on the nose of a helicopter and we would actually uh, load film. Now the IMAX camera is expensive. It takes, 50, it takes 50, uh, a 70 millimeter film with 15 perfs. It's about the size of a, a pa small pack of cigarettes. If you guys remember what the pack of cigarettes used to look like. And, and what happens is it rolls and one roll of film lasts three minutes and costs $4,000 for the raw footage. So when we talk about shooting 70 hours of IMAX, you can imagine how much this stuff costs. It was a million dollars for IMAX film we used. On our expedition down the Nile, we were allowed 12 rolls of film times three minutes. We had 35, 36 minutes of total footage that we were allowed on the river trip. And so that's what we got to shoot on the river. And so the space kit, okay, yeah. Here's a picture of the space cam. Again, here we are uh, on a stage setup shot on one of our boats. There's a helicopter space cam. What we would do is during the filming of the initial, before the expedition, we'd get the rafts ready to go through a rapid that we had set up. Then we would go ahead and radio in and they'd send a helicopter with a space cam down and they would take those beautiful pictures of us rafting through the, through the rapids. Here's another picture of Tissensot Falls with the helicopter going right up to the edge. Now you don't see it, there's actually a cameraman right here with the IMAX camera. And the scene you see in the movie where the waterfall's exposed, there's actually one of our teammates are in there with an IMAX camera flying right up to the edge of the waterfall taking pictures with the IMAX camera. Where's the raft? What's that? Where's the raft? The rafts are actually to the right, you can't see them. Yeah, I'll, show, I'll show you another photo of them. Yes? When you repelled down from uh, how did you recover the ropes or did you just leave them? We just, well, we had big beaners. You would pull down. I don't know if you've met Mountaineer. What you do is you set up a sling with a beaner. When you come down, you just pull the ropes and then take off. That's what we do. You want to know how we got our ropes back. A lot of rope. Lot of rope. And so uh, here's another picture. For example, you see these shots of us going through the main parts of the rapids. Hey, there's the IMAX camera. That's a 100-pound camera with a tripod and a specially made frame. We made all these frames. So what happens, when they called me in late September and said we want to do the film, I said, when do you need the stuff? They said, we're leaving in October. I said, what are you, crazy? I mean, it's just September. So we actually called, I called a place in South Africa. I took an old Avon raft that I had apart. We sent over to them and they built us four yellow rafts. And I built all the frames, dry boxes, equipment, and everything in Denver, Denver, Colorado. And we shipped it all over to e or, uh, Ethiopia for the filming. But what we would do is we'd run the river We'd have these guys with the red shirts. That's another whole story. They'd pick the rafts up, and they'd walk back up above the rapid. We'd run it again, and they'd pick the raft up, and they'd run it again. We'd pick the raft up, we'd run it again. So every rapid for about a 10-mile stretch, which are big rapids, we would run 20 or 30 times for the IMAX cameras. And so this is what we did for almost 30 days. We would film and film and film. So after 30 days of filming in Ethiopia with a 100-man film crew, dozens of hours of IMAX footage. We then went, took a plane, we flew all the equipment over Sudan to, Ethi or to Egypt. We filmed in Egypt. After 30 days, the camera crews took all their equipment, took everything, they packaged it up, put it in a case, put it in containers, and they left. They all went home. They were dead tired. 30 days of filming every day on the river, 12 to 14, 15, 16 hours a day as we worked. With everybody gone, Gordon and I were left alone. We took two rafts that we had, two IMAX cameras, a small one on this kayak, and the main, the main big camera. We went back to Ethiopia with 12 rolls of film. We took the equipment. We walked up to the headwaters of the Blue Nile, and for the next 114 days and 3,500 miles, we did a river trip, the first descent ever the Blue Nile and Nile. To say we were tired when we started is an understatement. I was exhausted. But there's something about the adventure, the adrenaline, of knowing you're going into a big adventure in the unknown that no one's ever done, that drove us on. This is a picture of the day before we started on our expedition, the last day in Egypt. You know, I said, hey, let's take a, let's do this. Let's take a picture of us in front of the pyramids and let's make a vow that we're not gonna give up, we're not gonna stop 
ever until we come back to Egypt and take another picture in front of the pyramids. That said, this is the source of the Nile. 10,000 feet in a spring called Gishabai, in the springs of Sakal in Ethiopia, the most holy place of Ethiopia, is a marsh. And in that marsh, they put a small uh, Ethiopian Orthodox monastery, and there's a small uh, baptismal font. And coming out is a small pipe that's draining the swamp. And it drains just like this. And I filled a water bottle, an Algene water bottle up with this, and I duct taped it, and we put it in front of our kayaks, and we took those bottles from here all the way to the uh, Mediterranean. Again, another, we, we were still telling ourselves we weren't gonna give up. In fact, I still have that water. I should have brought it, Dave, but I'm giving you a sip. <laughs> <laughs> Turn around outside the monastery, and this is what it looks like. The springs of Gishabai in Sakala at almost 10,000 feet, and it's a small river. So the river starts really, really small like this, and, every, and so for the first 70 kilometers, 40 miles, we carried our equipment, and we walked, and we hiked. Gets Gordon and I starting off. Again, these are our little bottles there. It was just him and I left. So here we are a few days later at the Springs of Geshebai. So this is what we did. We took off, and for the next 70 kilometers in a day and a half, we walked down the river. We never left the river. You're already bandaged. Yeah, you know, that bandage, he, good to say, that bandage, that's a whole story I can tell you there, too. That was actually during the filming. I put an oarlock through my leg when we flipped a boat. So we were, we were kind of hurting. We were, we were tired to begin with. Okay, as, as we walk further down the river, the river's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Again, we had 70 kilometers of this type of thing. It's in the Ethiopian highlands. It's lush green, it's pretty. But every kilometer, the river's getting bigger and bigger because it's getting side streams coming in. One day, we, this is the river below us. So one day we came over here and we couldn't cross this river right here because we didn't want to get our boots wet. So we noticed they had this bridge right here. We said, we'll just cross the bridge, except the local militia didn't want us to cross the bridge. So I went over to the local militia, and I'd been learning a little bit at Park, and I said, tell you what, I just start talking to them, told them what we were doing. I said, can we take a photo together? They said, sure. They gave me their gun. <laughs> we took a photo, and then we crossed the bridge, and they were our best friends forever. And that's what started off the expedition. When we first started this expedition, we were starting the, in the highlands of Ethiopia, most of these villagers hadn't seen Westerners ever. The kids would run away screaming because they'd never seen Westerners. The Ethiopia had just come out of a grueling 40-year civil war. They did, the civil war had just ended. There were no road system. There was no electric in the country, hardly. It was really a country in tatters. And so we didn't know what we were doing. But what we found out in Ethiopia and the Sudan and Egypt is that people were the friendliest people we could ever imagine. I can count on the back of, on one hand, the times we were really in danger, and that was usually from the police and the military who kept wanting to arrest us for some reason or the other. With the exception of that, it was a wonderful experience. This is a classic northern uh, Highlander, she's Amhara. Um, again, the people are beautiful there. She kind of smirking at us there, but she was so friendly, and everybody was just a beautiful people, and we had a beautiful time in that part of the river. Now, story, quick story. So here we are, we're dead tired, we just walked 70 kilometers, we were tired, we were cold, we hadn't eaten for a day and a half because we didn't want to carry food, we had our cameras with us and everything, and we got, went ahead and we came to this little village and there was nobody there, so Gord and I laid down on the ground and we started to go to sleep and a few minutes later some villagers showed up and they brought some wood with them and they said, are you hungry, they gave us a little food and they built us a fire to keep us warm. Late that night, we woke up and the villagers started leaving and one by one they all went and next thing we knew we woke up the next morning and there were two little seven-year-old girls sleeping by the fire little girls and we asked the, the, the elder the next day why they did that and they said well we we're afraid you guys get cold so we asked our daughters to keep the fire burning all night for you guys oh. now can you imagine this country if some strangers came in the middle were cold making a fire, inviting your house, and having your little seven-year-old daughter look after him. I mean, it's, it was an unbelievable experience seeing what true innocence and just lack of fear had in these villagers and the Highlanders. 
And so that really set the tone for the expedition. And so it helped the, the entire time we were on the river, we just had friendliness. A few miles later, we got to Lake Tana. We boated across Lake Tana with our kayaks. And I can show you tons of, you gotta remember, six months, I have 10,000 photos, 800 hours of video and IMAX. So we could stay here for days, I can show you. <laughs> Flight shows, but we're not. So I'm gonna have to skip part. So the upper part of the river is full of rapids. It's all kayakable. Uh, we did a lot of filming, but we finally got to Lake Tana. We went across Lake Tana, and the first thing out of Lake Tana is Tissisot Falls. One of the larger waterfalls in Africa, the second largest falls in Africa, Victoria Falls. This is us rappelling down the waterfall. Right there, see a person? There's one person right there. Okay? And our goal was to, 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 to walk kayak, raft, or walk the entire Nile. That's what we ended up doing. So this again was now the big step. So we leave the upper part of the river. We now come to the Tissisot Falls. Once we leave Tissisot Falls, we go into the Black or the uh, Northern Gorge, which is the start of the Big Rapids. So here we are about a week and a half into the expedition. Gordon was the real photographer. I was the expedition leader, but Gordon was the cameraman, the IMAX cameraman. I helped him a lot because you can't just be, you can't just be two people and not learn how to, and not go ahead and, uh, and uh, learn how to use a camera. So what Gordon would do for all these shots you see, you're gonna see a situation on the, on the film where he's going down the waterfall, and I wanna show how that was made. Here's a picture of Gordon. We took one of the IMAX cameras, right there, the small IMAX camera, Gordon would tie the rope to his kayak right here, and I would hold that black rope. That was me holding that rope. We would take Gordon, he'd give me the thumbs up, he would drop himself over the edge of the waterfall, and it's 153 feet down to that bottom. And he would lower himself while I lowered the camera with him on the front of his kayak. And that's how we got that shot. So when you see it in the movie, there's a picture of him going down the falls, think that there's a camera on the front of that kayak, and that's what this, this camera is. thing here is yeah, see if you can yeah my thumbs get tired <laughs> all right there it is I got I'll keep working it all right so as we're going down the river now we leave Titsisot Falls we enter what's called the northern gorge of the Nile this rapid has a first descent we ran this rapid this rapid was a big rapid by any standards. We actually ran a section over here, but right off this side here, we ran that chute over here, but this is the type of rapid we would run. This is about a 35 foot tall rapid from beginning to end. Every rapid, there was a, probably a run over here, but we didn't want to get in this stuff. So again, being an expedition with only two of us um, and a, IMAX cameras, we didn't want to take a risk of losing the IMAX cameras. So we would run rapids like this, but there were several rapids we actually had to portage through here because they were just too dangerous. Usually if it's just a big rapid like this, we'll take a chance of running it because there's a run out down here and if we flip a boat, we can usually save it if you don't get eaten by the crocodiles. So that was the main, main part here. Yeah, I've got one of these, you want use mine? Yeah, well, no, it, let me uh, see, take it and go halfway up. Well, you, you say click. Is, What's that? Here, you want to use, I've got one if you want to redo it. No, well, he has a particular signal that he's picking up at his laptop. Okay, let me see. You know, it's just, if I go up halfway, it's going to be closer. All right. All right, here's, if, yeah, I want you to tame right here. We'll start doing it again. Yeah. We'll, we'll go. All right, so here's another picture of the rapid we're wow. running here, but wow. this is, again, it's a typical rapid we'd run on the river. You can see we have our workers in the front with helmets on, and then we would run these rapids. Here's, here's Gordon, his kayak right here. We had two rafts, two, two yellow 16-foot rafts, and Gordon his kayak is what we had on the expedition. And remember, there's only two of us with three boats. Oh. So I had to go ahead and run every rapid twice in the raft. I would take the camera raft through, then I'd walk back up and we'd take the second raft through. So we did that for probably 400 rapids during the expedition. Here's another picture going through the rapids. Um, a lot of times, because I had the IMAX camera with me, I didn't want to take a chance of going forward. So I would run the raft to rapids backwards. We'd take a lot of the equipment off the raft. We'd walk it around. Uh, we would walk it around, then we would go ahead. I'd tie the IMAX camera on the back, and we'd run the rapids. Try to get it through. We did this for uh, 800 miles in Ethiopia. This is a picture of the Northern Gorge. Now, 
that, remember that big wide river you guys just saw? That wide river is now this wide. This is actually a bridge that the locals use to crawl across. It's probably 15 <laughs> feet wide. At one time, the Blue Nile got so big and, through, and so narrow that I couldn't even use my oars. We had to ship the oars, it means tie the oars on and just send the raft through. Mm. Because it was too, the, the canyon's too narrow to actually row. And the whole canyon, I don't know how deep the water is here, it must be a million feet deep. <laughs> because the whole river has to go in this thing. It's crashing white water. Again, we never, we never missed a single inch of the river. Uh, this picture of a portage. Well, we, what's that? Are those all basalts? Yeah, yeah, good question. Okay, geologists. <laughs> yes, they're all basalts. No, the Ethiopia, yeah, the, the main cap of Ethiopia is all basalt flows that, that are, are carved in. The big canyons of Ethiopia, the reason they're there is because they get so much rainfall in the basalts that it just carves through these basalts and creates these huge canyons. And that's what we have here, polished basalts. So some of the river, as it got a little bit wider, for example, this is wide enough to row. The problem is this rapid starts about 300 feet above what you see. It goes through four or five class five holes, crashes into a wall down here, and then heads off down the canyon. Now, we had several instances which we almost drowned, several of us trying to get these rafts when we actually try to run them. So what we decided the best thing to do would be just a, what's called portage rapids. We take the rapids and we rope them through the rapids. So what we would do is we would set up our ropes There'd be two or three ropes in there. There's Gordon. And we would go ahead and lower the boats over, and we would slowly try to bring the boats down without getting them swamped. And then we'd pull them into an eddy and get them. One time, we almost lost a raft in which it broke loose, and it went on down the river. Fortunately, we were able to get it. Because again, all of our equipment is on these boats. This canyon is so remote, is so remote, that the villagers had never even seen Westerners before. None of the villagers along Canyon. In the 800 miles I was in Ethiopia, I never saw a single light bulb or village on the Blue Nile. No one lives on the Blue Nile because it's in too big a deep a canyon. There's too many crocodiles, there's too much schistosomiasis, and there's too many mosquitoes down the bottom. So no one lives there. We, he wanted to know about food and water. What we started doing is we originally went with some canned stuff, and we're pretty good cooks. We would use that in the first part. I had pasta, I made spaghetti and pasta, and we'd rice and stuff like that. And then as we got in the lower stretches of the Nile into Sudan, there would be some villages appearing, so we would go buy chicken and meat off the villagers, bread and stuff like that. We lived off the land and off the locals the entire time we were in Africa. We never had food that brought in for us. Okay, the Grand Canyon of the Nile. We just left the Northern Gorge. Now, a lot of people here don't realize there's a thing called the Grand Canyon of the Blue Nile that's the same exact dimensions as the Grand Canyon of the United States. It's five to 6,000 feet deep. It's 300 miles long. And these, this is the inner gorge of the Grand Canyon. These are basalt cliffs right here. And this is the type of river, that, this is the type of situation that we rode for a while as we we're going down the river. Again, we had two, two rafts, two 16-foot rafts, white water Grand Canyon style rafts, and we had a kayak. We had seven helpers that went down to six helpers, Ethiopians, that was the whole crew. And that's, who, that's what we did for the entire time we were in Ethiopia. Here's some basalt columns. It's pretty cool, isn't it? In the middle of the river, as we're coming down, all of a sudden we see these huge basalt columns that had never been mapped before. And we would just float down. Actually, we're coming this way. We're coming from right to left down the river. And uh, you'll see this in the film. Uh, we uh, were able to go ahead and uh, float this stuff. This is in the middle of the gorge, middle of the Grand Canyon. Just spectacular scenery. And no one, you know, virtually no one's ever seen it. Uh, the IMAX camera, let me kick it through a little bit. Again, remember, we had no film crew. And a lot of people think, ask me, hey, do you have a film crew? There was no film crew. It was just Gordon and myself. I rode both rafts with the camera strapped on. The problem with only having 36 minutes of film is you can't waste it. So every time we got to an area we thought was interesting or a series of rapids, we would stop, scout the whole situation out downriver, come back, and if we thought it was worth filming, we'd set up the camera. It took us a day to set up the camera. What we would do, then, um, we would go ahead and take the camera, we'd take everything off the boats, we'd take the tripod, which weighed about 60 pounds, we'd take the cam, which weighed 100 pounds, we would go then and mount the camera. We'd have to roll, remember, it's all film, so we would have to get the, the reels of film. We'd have to load the magazine with film. We'd have to get it set up. We'd have to get it all ready to go. We'd put the equipment back on to hide the camera, because we're making a film. We didn't want people to see the camera. So we'd stack boxes on. 
we'd take the camera, we'd strap it down, and we'd put life preservers around it so I didn't get killed if I hit it. And then we would take off down the river. Before we did that, though, with only 36 minutes of film, I had to make sure the footage was right. So we would spend forever, it seems, saying up, down, right, left. And I would practice rowing so that when you see me row, what we had a picture, you're just not shooting the sky or down at my feet or something. So that's what we would do right here. And we would get a set. Again, this is film, it's not video. All said and done, we took off down the river. I put the guys back in the river and we'd punch off down. And we'd shoot. We'd start the camera and we'd take off. And let me tell you, the hardest thing about making a film in Ethiopia is trying to tell some little Ethiopian who doesn't speak English to turn the camera off and on. Because <laughs> that was tough. So this is uh, Mike. We did have a couple days there. We did have a guy come in named Mike Prosser. Um, it's in the book. If you guys uh, buy a copy of the book, I've got some copies up here that everything's being donated to HGS. But we did have a guy named Mike who came and helped us for a while. He rode a raft for just a short period of time, a few days, uh, in the middle part of uh, 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 the upper gorge. Um, he, had a, he had a bad spill, almost drowned, and he pulled off the expedition. Now, the interesting thing about this film is, is see this guy, these two guys right here? These are Ethiopian guards. And this guy here is our cook. This is Johannes. And he's not happy. <laughs> because when we hired him, we told him he was going on a float down the Nile. And we needed a cook. And the first set of rapids we took him through, he was petrified. And he was actually in the flip scene in the movie you see, you're going to see, he's in that raft. And he can't swim. And so when the raft went over in this class five rapid, he wouldn't get back on the river, but he had to get back on one of the rafts. Either that or he had to walk out. So that's one way he kept him. But these guys are the most fearless guys. None of these guys could swim. None of them could swim. And if you could see the three to 400 class five waterfalls and rapids we went through in 114 days, you'd be shocked. Mike backed out. When, when Mike, Mike uh, went through a big rapid, got thrown out of the boat, swam forever in a rapid, came up, he said, that's it. I'm not going any further which is a problem because that left me rowing both rafts. So what we had to do occasionally is we had to take the camera in the bigger part of the rapids where it was truly class five, six white water with no out. We would actually hire locals to take the camera, strap it to a board and walk the camera down part of the Nile. And we did this day after day after day, filming a little bit, walking with it, putting it on, on the rafts and going in. So it was a long, long, drawn-out process. We had guards with us occasionally. These are Le Mumbaye. I and these were the two guys in the front of the raft in that other picture. <laughs> this is after they got out of the white water, they put their uniforms back on <laughs> and got their guns. But they were actual soldiers. They were special forces soldiers. They were with us. They were given to us by the government, said, you take these guys with you. We went through, parts right, we went through hell together couple times. We were arrested twice. These guys were disarmed by some of the local militia, marched off into the mountains. It was epic, some of these things. But they never, never lost their nerve, and they never got scared, and they stayed with us through the bitter end until we hit the Sudan. And to this day, we still communicate and talk, because obviously it was one of the greatest adventures of their life. Just wonderful guys. Hippo. You got to talk about some wildlife. Yes, there's a lot of wildlife on the Nile, the upper Blue Nile. Being in the deep Deep Canyon, it's one of the last areas of Ethiopia that still really has wildlife. The rest of Ethiopia is, is highly deforested, lots of people. There's 90 million people in Ethiopia, but no one lives along the Blue Nile. So here's the hippo in the river. And, whoop. Okay, ah, just, now, it, it, when I don't want it to go ahead, it goes ahead. <laughs> there were crocodile. The Nile croc is the biggest croc in the world. Yes. Perfectly common to see a 10, 12, 13, 14 foot crocodile. Crocodiles eat alligators for breakfast. An alligator's a lizard compared to a crocodile. Look at the teeth. You don't see those. And alligators are big and they're fast. The thing about a crocodile is they love kayaks that are smaller than they are. <laughs> We must have had a hundred crocodile attacks where Gordon would be in his kayak, crocodiles would run off the shore, they'd make a beeline towards his kayak, and he would have to hit the water. One time, he almost got taken. 
when he wasn't paying attention, we were going down a series of rapids and a big misconception that people think there's no crocodiles in rapids, that's crazy. Plenty of crocodiles live in rapids. We were going down, he was facing downstream, a big crocodile, big Nile croc, jumped off the shore and went straight towards him. And the boat's going up and down, the rafts are there, we're going down this rapidy river, and we're screaming at Gordon, crocodile, crocodile. And to this day, I'll never forget Alemu, one of my guards, taking his AK-47 up on the raft as he was going up and down, trying to shoot this crocodile that's two feet from Gordon's, Gordon's kayak. And all I could think of is calling McGill of Films and telling him, well, good news, bad news. The good news is he didn't get eaten by a crocodile. Bad news, he got shot by one of our guards. <laughs> so this was the thing that happened. And so we just, it was just a constant threat of crocodiles on this river. And if you didn't like that, try sleeping with this baby at night. Yeah, needless to say, I slept on the raft almost every night. Ethiopia is in the deepest part of the Blue, Blue Nile. It's full of crocodiles. It's full of wildlife, monkeys, uh, colobus monkeys. It's just a beautiful place. It's a beautiful existence down there. No people. As we approached Sudan, the Nile opened up and it started to calm down. All of the rapids of the Nile are in Ethiopia. That's why Ethiopia is Ethiopia. When people used to go up towards the Ethiopia, the conquerors, they just couldn't get into the mountains. They couldn't go up the river. There's too many rapids. The canyon was too narrow. It was too dangerous. Down in Sudan is different. This is the Beni Shungul Gumus tribe. These are lower Nilotic peoples now. They're no longer Highland Amhara tribe. They're the low, no, lowlanders. This fellow here had never, none of these people had ever seen their picture taken, had never seen a camera. And these are his four wives. So he had his picture taken with his four wives, and he wanted, to wanted me to show him the picture and everything. We, made, we had good friends. We became good friends. They actually, this is one of the first villages we stopped at, and we actually could get some food because we had finally left the highlands of Ethiopia. Um, the Bene Shangul Gumus are just beautiful people, and they live right on the Nile. Um, they still speak a, a Nilotic language. They're animists, either Christians nor Muslims at this point in time. And so we knew we were getting really remote on the lower, lower Nile. Um, this girl here, she saw us and she knew right away what to do. She knew we were taking pictures and so she ran up back home to her place and she got all dolled up. <laughs> she got all dolled up in her stuff and then she had, we took a bunch of pictures of her and we got dozens of poses of her. But she was just really pretty. And uh, here they are again, some of the kids in the area. It was fun. This is the very, 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 very first tribe we met on the Nile, the Sudan border. These are girls a little further down as we entered Sudan. Notice the difference now. This is an uh, Islamic culture. These are Sudanese kids. They speak Arabic. But same, up and down the Nile. See, see you looking at us. She's looking at us. They're like, wow, check this out. What's coming down the Nile? Remember, we were the first boats ever down the Nile. So they had never seen anybody come down. As we left Ethiopia, the mountains got smaller, the canyons got smaller. The rapids stayed pretty good for a while. Um, so the, ra the, the rapids stayed, remember, we, I got to name 400 rapids, class three, four, five, and six rapids in this, on this area. And the rapids stayed big. You know, we would routinely run these things and rapid after rapid. Um, this is a picture, this is, uh, um, again, this is how we rigged the boats. There's the IMAX camera. Up front, I had some fuel. We actually had a small motor with us in the back. We didn't use too much lower down. These dry boxes, this is where the film was kept in these dry boxes. I had 12 rolls of film, some of our other dry boxes, and this is how we rode every single rapid. Again, we had to row, I had to row double rapids almost every almost the entire expedition. This is the last rapid in Ethiopia, and I call this the last rapid on the Nile. I'm right at the border. Those mountains are in Sudan. This is vol volcanics. Right? I'm sorry, this is from Cambrian here. This is not volcanics. Is all pre-Cambrian here, and we're just entering. We're going around this corner, and the river stops right there. There's no more rapids. It's the end of the river. It's the end of this. From then on, it's just flat, flat water. It's the very, very last rapid. So at this point, we'd run almost 800 miles of river, and we'd uh, spent almost 40 days doing it in that period of time. This is on the Sudan border. So again, these are our guys. There's our two guards: Alain Mubaye, uh, Yabeltal. Uh, Yalu, Johannes, he actually stayed with us the entire trip. He was actually getting pretty good towards the end. Still couldn't swim, but he, he got good advice. We left the guys. They were not allowed to go into Sudan. So once we saw these guys, we left them. They took off, 
and we were stuck on the border. We did not have permission to get into Sudan. No way. Sudanese would give us no permission. The governments of Sudan and the United States were not talking. We had no visas. We had nothing. We went ahead and were stuck there for almost a week on the border. Finally, Gordon and I decided we're not waiting any longer. Nobody was giving us permission, so we just took off. And we entered the Sudan illegally with our boats and our cameras. And we thought, this is too easy because there was no one on the shore. We went ahead and got a whole, oh, here's, let me back up here. This is the river, again, there were no maps, too. So I was dealing with entirely a one to a million and one to a half million aeronautical charts are the only maps I had. So half the time, Gordon and I would look at each other saying, you know, where are we on the river? We think we're here. We don't know where we're at. So we did this for, for the entire time. So this is an average, you know, trying to figure out what we were doing most of the time. And being a geologist, I love maps. But something about running a river with big white water without maps, it scares you all the time. As we, so what we've done now is we've gone from here all the way down, Northern Gorge, Big Rapids, the Grand Canyon, the Black Gorge, and this is the Western Gorges, and the last rapid is right in here. Now, we just ran the border. Remember, here's the border of Sudan. We waited in Bomanza for a week. No one would give us permission. No one wanted us to go, so we just took off and we entered the Sudan illegally. Four miles into Sudan, we got caught by the Sudanese army. Four miles is all we got. They took us, they took our boats, pulled us over, and at first, what we thought is this is gonna be terrible because we saw all these soldiers running down the river running down the shore towards us. There must have been 30 armed Sudanese soldiers running down the river towards us until we realized they had their laundry with them. <laughs> and they started washing their clothes. <laughs> so we're thinking, wow, that's crazy. So we talked to them and we asked them where the commander was. And we went up and we met Commander Mohammed Mohammed, who spoke perfect Queen's English. And he looked at us. I took his picture. We became buddies. He asked me what we were doing. I said we were running the Nile, but I didn't have any permission to enter Sudan because I couldn't get a visa. He took a piece of paper, maybe this big, and wrote something in Arabic on it and said, take this piece of paper. If anybody ever stops you, show them this piece of paper and it'll get you through. And that piece of paper got us clear through Sudan with no problems. You know, I don't know what it said. <laughs> And you want to hear something? I lost the piece of paper. I can't believe it. I kept, I'm, you people don't know how careful I'm about keeping stuff. I've got everything I've ever had in my life but that piece of paper. But he said you'll not, and I think it said these people are my guests, da 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 da, keep doing it. And I showed that paper to people that I never ever had a problem. And I never did get a visa for Sudan, all the way through Sudan. So it was a great experience, you know. And so everything I'd heard about Sudan, about being scared, I had no problems. So Mohammed Mohammed set us up in the Sudan and we took off. Once in the Sudan, he gave us one of his guards. Okay, I'm gonna tell you this quick story here. I know we got five minutes, 10 minutes. All right, 10 minutes left. We start taking, now, no member, no more rapids, no more canyons, no more highland, no more Amhar. It's, it's Islamic, fundamentalist Sudan. So here we are entering, he gives us one of his guards. He says, go with these guys and go to the next town and help them through. Now, he didn't tell us that there's a reservoir in there. There was a dam built by the British in the 20s and 30s that was full of silt and sand. And if it's easy enough to follow a river, but if a river empties into a filled up reservoir, the river now becomes 10 to 15 miles wide. So he went with us, and this is what happened. The river died. And we didn't know where to go. We are out of Ethiopia. These are some volcanic, a few remaining volcanic cones. That's it. And it's just jungle and swamp everywhere. And this is what it looked like, the river. It was miles and miles wide. We didn't know where we were going. We were lost. So we just pointed it in one direction and started going down what we thought was going down the river. We had to sleep in the swamp for a couple nights. And it got darker and darker and darker on us, and we had nowhere to camp. And it got darker and darker and darker on us. We didn't know where we were at. And then it got black. <laughs> and we knew ahead of us was a dam with soldiers on the dam. 
And in Africa, you realize that facilities like dams and power plants are heavily guarded in the, in the continent of Africa. The soldier with us was so scared of where we were going that he told us we couldn't go any further. He wanted us to hold back. Because he was afraid if we went to the dam site that we'd be shot at if they didn't know who we were. And so we waited there. We slept out on the boats in the swamp that night with no food and no fire because we were sitting on boats in the middle of the swamp. And the next morning we woke up and there in the distance was the dam site. So we started motoring towards the dam site slowly and the soldiers scared and Gordon was, we were all, both of us were scared because we didn't know what was happening. Up here there were some anti-aircraft sites and there were soldiers running around on top of the dam site you could see with their guns. And a whole platoon came down towards the shore towards us in their trucks and we're afraid. And as we pulled up towards the shore, we pushed ahead and I was, it was really frightening. We got out and the commander came over to us and asked us and told us, he looked at us and said, where were you guys? We've been inspecting you all night. <laughs> commander Mohammed Mohammed radio ahead and said to expect you guys. So we were worried, we're trying to find you guys. So they'd been out all night trying to find us. <laughs> so, so it was one of those things that we were frightened and there was just no reason to be. So they helped us around the dam site. We floated the rest of that part of the Nile. That's another whole big adventure because if you've, anybody's ever been in the Sudan, it's absolutely the most fantastic country in Africa in terms of old infrastructure and the scenery is unbelievable. And we hit, this, we hit Khartoum. And here's the confluence. There's the city of Khartoum. This is the confluence of the Blue Nile and the White Nile. And that shows the difference in the size of the rivers. And there's our two little boats right there. Two rafts and hauling a kayak. And there we are. So we had come around, we hit Khartoum. We actually dropped, that was the only drop we had. We dropped our film off in Khartoum and they had uh, 12 rolls, a new film waiting for us. We took it, we took our boats, and we took off. And this is a rare photo of the confluence of the White Nile and the Blue Nile. There's the Blue Nile and there's the White Nile. And they truly are like different color. It's pretty cool, isn't it? And so here we are. We had just ended up, Gordon and I, running the entire first full descent of the Blue Nile history. No one had ever accomplished it. So we had just run the Blue Nile. We had hit the White Nile. Now we're on the Nile. When the, after Khartoum becomes a Nile, for the next two months, we ran the White Nile. So here we are. We came all the way down, down the river, into Sudan, went all the way in this stretch, and we're now right here at Khartoum. Now we had the great S bend of the Nile and all the way out. And this was one of the most fantastic experiences, again, I've ever had. The White Nile, the main Nile is fantastic. This is, this is Moroi, the pyramids of Moroi. A lot of people don't realize that Sudan has some of the greatest pyramids around. They're not quite as big as the pyramids in Egypt, but there's hundreds and hundreds of them. And during that we were going down the Nile, we'd see these pyramids in the distance, and we'd stop the boats, we'd take off, we'd go explore these pyramids, and there'd be sand up against them, they'd be half buried with sand. We know that it had been years and years since anybody had seen this type of stuff because this country was closed. Okay, here it is. Another fort. A lot of people don't realize, but as the, uh, as the, the, the Greeks and the Romans and everybody were pushing up the Nile in thousands of years, cultures left forts on the top. So along the Nile, there were dozens and dozens of these forts that had built by the Ottomans and the Greeks and the Romans, and they were all abandoned. So we would stop off, we'd hike up, and we'd explore these old forts that were literally thousands of years old. And no way to get to them unless you're on the Nile, because most of them are islands in the middle of the Nile. And so we'd stop and we'd film them, do things. Uh, here's an abandoned city. This is the last Christian city in Egypt right here, full Christian city on the upper Nile. It was abandoned 400 years ago, and again, it was just nothing. We'd walk in there and it was just fantastic. There'd be jars and urns and ruins and relics just everywhere along the Sudanese Nile. Um, at one time, Sudan had a fleet of steamers going up and down the Nile. They're all gone. But again, there's some abandoned steamers, big ships, not little ones, that would be there. We would get off and we'd go into these old, you know, Victor uh, turn of the century steamers, you know, late 1800s. We'd go in there and they'd all be abandoned. There's hundreds of them. They're abandoned along the Nile. So it's just an incredible experience to go there. The, another picture of this is what the typical Sudanese, you know, the river is big and wide here. There's granite, uh, it's huge, hundreds of foot tall sand dunes that are caked against the granite, palm trees, and just pristine and quiet. 
There were no tourists. We never saw a single tourist the entire time we were in Sudan. Nothing. It was just nothing. There was just nothing there but villages, just beautiful villages. Um, every night we would get occasional sandstorms. We would camp along the ocean, uh, along the river, and we'd watch the sunset. This is actually sun, not the moon. It'd be setting through the sandstorms, and it would just be a, just an amazing experience going month, you know, day after day. So here we got. Okay. Here we got to the border of Egypt. So we had gone through Ethiopia, rapids, crazy crocodiles and everything in Ethiopia and everything. We got to Sudan. Sudan's nothing but, but big open flat water and, and sand dunes and just beautiful scenery and friendly people. And we got to the border of Egypt. And guess what? The Egyptians didn't want us in either. <laughs> and we're thinking, well, this is nuts. We couldn't get into Sudan, so we had to run the border, and here we are trying to get in Egypt. And this is the beginning of Lake Nasser, because there's where the border is. So we waited four or five days in a place called Wadi Halfa, which is on the border of Egypt, or Sudan and Egypt. We waited, waited, couldn't get a permit, couldn't get a permit, couldn't get a permit. Finally, we decided, we did it once, let's try it again. <laughs> so we went ahead, and everybody knows that armies sleep at night, right? So we waited till almost dark, and we took off across Lake Nasser into Egypt. And as you can see, it's, it's just crystal calm, perfect water. Nobody. We went 10 miles into Egypt. We didn't see anything or anybody. And then out of the distance, we saw a patrol boat. And this big boat started coming at us, and it was a lot faster than our little raft with a 10 horsepower, 15 horsepower Merck engine because we were going like two miles an hour. So I took off and I tried to get back to Sudan. <laughs> and, I'm, and every time the boat would come up on my left, I'd go right. And I'd go right, he'd go left. And then he started circling around us because he knew what we were trying to do. And finally he came up and he grabbed our boats and his soldiers jumped on our rafts. And this guy in a perfectly white Navy suit jumps on there and in perfect English says, Welcome to Egypt. Now get out of your boat. They took us, they arrested us, and they took us to their post. And for the next week, we had to fight and argue and everything, try to get released. And it took an interception by the American ambassador, the Charge d'Affaires, and the military attaché to Egypt to get us released. And believe it or not, they actually gave us a permit to cross the lake. <laughs> so we went ahead and went back to where they picked us up, we put our boats in, and then we went across Lake Nasser. And the Lake Nasser, you'll see in the movie, that was the whole thing. We had a storm and almost drowned in Lake Nasser, but that's a different story. There's a patrol boat that docks. They look kind of nice. They're, this is a lot faster than our rafts. So, but so, so here we are. We finally hit, after Lake Nasser, we finally hit Aswan. Who's been to Egypt? Okay. This looks like Egypt, doesn't it? This is, this is Aswan. Well, can you imagine not a single person did we see or a single light or a single village in Ethiopia for 800 miles. We saw no tourists at all, just some villagers in the Sudan. We hit Egypt and it was nothing but tourists. <laughs> This one tourist is a, a village of uh, a Sobek, which is, um, who can help me? The Sobek crocodile god. Um, oh. yeah. it, what's that? Cornan? No, it's not Cornan. I'll think of it just a second. It's just let my mind. At one time, there were so many tour boats in Egypt. They were double parked. One, two, three tour boats. They had no place to park, so there would be the tour boats would line up and park, and then another road line up and park, then another road line up and park these boats. At one time we counted, there were 21,000 tourists at one tourist spot. So we went, look at the smoke, look at the smokestacks. We went from pristine to tourists, mosques, trains, cars, people for the rest of our village journey. We had nothing but people to do. And the biggest challenge was just staying, staying away from the tourists in this part of the street. As we, and uh, every night, in fact, you know, because of the dam, a lot of people don't realize there's no more sand in Egypt right now. It's all gone. All the sand is kept in the Aswan High Dam. 
So as you leave the dam, there are no more sandbars. So every night we had to camp out on a police station. There, every few miles there'd be a police station on the Nile. We'd just pull up and they, they'd like us and we'd camp out, you know, and, and go ahead and, and do our little thing there. So we did that the rest of the time. Now, as we started entering Cairo, Cairo is the largest city in Egypt, and our largest Arabic city in the world, 21 million people plus or minus, and they all live along the Nile. So as we were getting close to Cairo, we started seeing these huge skyscrapers coming down there. And this was our patrol. Once we hit Egypt, we were never allowed to be out of the eye, the, uh, the, the military or the Navy was with us the entire time. So what they would do is they'd be with us, and as they got to the next post, they, they'd uh, leave and another guy would come on, and so we would always have a, an escort with us the entire time we were in the roof. And as we got closer into Egypt, then we got a sight of what we had left almost four months earlier. Here's the pyramids of Giza through the outskirts of Cairo. So we knew we were getting closer. And this is a rare picture. You can only get this picture when you're on the Nile with all the skyscrapers and the pyramids in the background. And as we got closer, the Nile got bigger. And we hit Egypt proper. We finally pulled over right there. We pulled our boats over. We've been on the river 109 days or something at this point in time. We parked our boats at one of the police stations. We got out. We walked up to the Nile Hilton and we got our first cold beer in 109 days. And it was right here. And here we got a room, we had a credit card, so I got us some rooms, and then we actually slept that night, took a shower, and drank our cold beer. And we got in the rafts a few days later, and we went to the Mediterranean. And we made sure we went out, and all the way into the, sh into the surf, where there's no more river, and after 114 days, we went ahead and completed the first full descent of the Nile, Blue Nile and Nile, we sourced the Ethiopian highlands, all the way to the Mediterranean. And the thing I remember most about Africa, and if anybody has been there, I lived there part time, we have, uh, we have a farm in Namibia, is the sunsets. 114 sunsets I was able to see on the river. And it's just something I'll never forget every night watching the sun go down over the Nile River. You can't describe it. Every night's beautiful. That's something I'll never forget. Uh, and so that's what we ended up doing. We knew we had done it after we'd come back into Cairo. We knew that we had gone ahead. And it was fun because we didn't realize at the time, but we had made that, because we forgot that we had made that vow to ourselves at the pyramids 114 days earlier that we wouldn't give up. So that's the that's presentation. So.